You know, Lowell, I can tell you what's wrong with the country today. It's the machine age. Everywhere you look, it's machines, machines, machines. That's the trouble. The machines have got all the jobs. And there's only one solution. We've got to quit making machines, put padlocks on those we've got, and give the jobs back to the men. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Ed. Oh, uh, let me show you something over here. Have you ever been in this donut shop? No. <laughs> I like donuts, Ed, but donuts don't like me. Well, Lowell, there's something here that gives a lot of people indigestion of a different kind. And I'll tell you what it is. It's a mechanical gadget that can make more donuts in 10 minutes than mother could make in 10 days. Well, well, the old sinker has gone mechanical. Say, that machine's a honey, isn't it? Well, it certainly does everything. Except one thing, you still have to dunk them yourself. Oh, please, Lowell, I'm serious. That machine is only a sample of what's wrong with the country. What do you mean, uh, too many donuts? No, too many machines. Why, everywhere you look. Some machines doing the work that ought to be done by men. Everything's machine, machine, machine. The thing's got out of control. We've created a monster that's putting us all out of jobs. And I'll tell you, Lowell... All right, Ed, I'll be serious. As old Abe Martin used to say, it's amazing how a few facts will break up an argument. And the trouble is, a lot of us don't get the whole picture. You know, I wish you had been with me in the workshop of an old friend the other afternoon. He's retired now, living on a pension from the company that used to employ him as a foreman in its machine shops. But he still putters around, just because he loves machines. His son came in, accompanied by a friend with a point of view just like yours. Dad, uh, Ted here wants us to go back to the good old days. He's got it all figured out that machines are ruining the country. <laughs> Carl warned me that you'd give me an argument on that, Mr. Ryan. Of course, I don't mean we don't need some machinery, but just look at us today. Everything we used is made by somebody pushing a button. Why, if a machine run by one man can do 12 men's work, then that's 11 men's jobs gone. Now, that's just arithmetic, isn't it? Mm, maybe. They say figures don't lie. And certainly in the last 30 years, we've been putting in millions of labor-saving machines. So there must be tens of millions less jobs than in the old days. Sure. Why, there just aren't any jobs compared with, well, say, 50 or 60 years back. No. Let's just look at the record. Way back in 1870, it took 324 people working out of every thousand to produce all the things we needed. Then the next 60 years, we went machine mad, like Ted says. Till nowadays, those machines must have put most everybody out of work. But what's the facts? Why, now we have 400 factory workers employed out of every thousand people. Gosh, Dad, that means more men working with machines than without them. Sure it does. But some folks still think that machines destroy jobs. Now, I've been doing a lot of reading on that question. You see, since machines came in, we don't work such long hours. We all get time to do a little more reading. The fact is that machines increase the supply of things we need and give us the time to use them. For every job they take away, they make at least one new job and maybe more. New jobs and better jobs. And don't forget, it takes men to make the machines, to produce the increased amount of raw materials needed, and to sell, transport, and handle the increased volume of product. Now I remember back in my old hometown, we had two blacksmiths, busy most of the time, fixing wagons, shoeing horses and such. Blacksmith worked 14 hours a day and made a living, if he was lucky. He certainly wasn't renowned as an employer of labor. The horse and buggy business kept about 11 men working in our town, what with the two blacksmiths, two livery stables, and the feed store. So those 11 men never dreamed they'd have their jobs shot out from under them by this goofy-looking contraption. They said the horseless carriage business was just a fad. Couldn't last. The darn thing would blow up. Cost too much anyhow. But today, that town's got six filling stations, two repair shops, and an accessory store with steady jobs for 37 men, where 11 used to live off the horse and buggy. A lot more people in that town are working for the electric light company, where there wasn't this in the good old days. And there's a dozen stores on Main Street giving work to a hundred more people in place of the two people who used to work in the old general store. Why? 
because the machines have made all kinds of new things that people need and made so many of them that the price can be brought down where everybody can buy those things. Same with the automobile. How many cars were sold when they were mostly handmade? Wasn't much of an industry in those days because a man had to be wealthy to buy one. Today, machine production has provided some kind of a car for almost every family in America. There are over 20 million passenger cars on the roads today. Yeah, but how about the wagon drivers, the blacksmiths, and all those folks that lost their jobs because of the automobile? That's an honest question. Let's go inside where we can get the honest facts. Sit down, boy, and make yourself comfortable. Now, as I remember it, 1900 was the top year for the horse and buggy business. Let's see what the almanac says. Mm, here we are. It shows that about one million people were working as drivers, wagon makers, stable hands, and so forth. Now compare that one million jobs. And tough jobs they were, too, with almost three million jobs made by the automobile. Three times as many new jobs as the old jobs that were wiped out. Now let's look at some of the other job eater offers. In almost any office, you will find two machines that will certainly let one office worker do at least the work of two or three working by hand. Yeah, the typewriter and the adding machine must have tossed millions of office people out of jobs. In 1860, with no office machines, it took 4,369 clerks, bookkeepers, and so on for every million population. Now bring on your machines and watch those poor office workers get fired. Well, by Jiminy, 49,805 office workers instead of 4,000 or so per million population. Just 11 times as many as before they started doing their work by machine. But even with all the modern machinery we've got, we haven't begun to meet the demand for all the needs. Surveys by big industries have proved that even in 1929, our biggest year, we only produced about half enough the things our people need to give them the living standards they are working toward. And this doesn't even count the new industries just being born today. In a thousand laboratories, in big industries everywhere, men are working all the time to find ways to do things better and easier. Scientists and engineers are creating new jobs by perfecting new formulas and new machines. The chemists discovered how to spin a stream of liquid into a thread of rayon, and all of a sudden, right out of nowhere, we have an industry that created 109,000 jobs and $97 million in wages between 1913 and 1934. And that's just one example. In late years, we've seen 18 new industries giving jobs to 10 million men and women. You know them yourself. Automobiles, electrical apparatus, gasoline, typewriters, mechanical refrigerators, and a lot of others. Instead of destroying jobs, machines have made more of them. And right here you have the answer to why you and I, both of us, average American working men, enjoy the highest living standards of any working men in the world. 14 million of us own our own homes. Four out of five families own cars. Most of us have telephones, electric lights, and a thousand other comforts of life, besides insurance policies and saving accounts. All this progress has come because the machine has given us mass production so that everybody can enjoy the good things we produce. Why, we're sitting on top of the world, we Americans. And that's the story, Ed, from an old-timer who has been through the mill. You see, here in America, we have always worked on the idea that the best way to get ahead is to follow one simple rule. Multiply wealth, produce more of the world's goods, so that everybody can have a bigger share. Mass production. And that means more machines and bigger ones, bigger factories and more men on the payroll than we have ever seen before. That's what machines mean to America, Ed more of the good things of life, and more jobs for all of us.